Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so uh, very happy to have uh, John Kellner over from MIT uh, telling us about uh, fitting graphs to vector data. Just a bit of background, Graph, uh, John has done some wonderful work. His PhD thesis was on algorithms for linear programming. Uh, and uh, uh, since then, he's been working on a variety of uh, uh, methods, uh, applying spectral methods to graph theory. And today, he'll be telling us a little bit along those lines, I think. Great, thanks. So today I'm going to talk to you about some work I did with Dan Spielman and Sam Deitch on, um, I'm going to call it, so it's on machine learning. And I should give, come with the sort of beginning apology that I don't actually usually do machine learning. So I resisted the urge to call this something like amateur adventures in machine learning theory. <laughs> but it's, my work is in spectral graph theory. And so here basically the goal is going to be apply some, to apply some tools from spectral graph theory to machine learning. So let me start with the general picture. The general picture is that I'm just, present an approach motivated by spectral graph theory to really m a couple of the major problems in machine learning. So classification, clustering, regression. Um, and it's going to be a pretty broad approach. It's not going to be that specific to the individual problems, which is why we'll be able to sort of lay the groundwork. And then each of these problems are going to come with a couple sentences each of what you need to do to fit it to those specific ones. And what I'm going to give is a very simple, clean methodology that's going to produce surprisingly good solutions to these problems. So, you know, somewhat surprisingly, we're just going to do a pretty simple optimization problem. We're going to come up with a graph, and then we're going to take very straightforward techniques on these graphs and end up with empirical results that actually compare favorable, uh, favorably to the best known algorithms for each of these individual problems, really with no problem-specific tuning. So the basic scheme is as follows. It's pretty, pretty uh, simple. It says what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of vectors in space. And the idea we're going to have is, you know, I'll give you a bunch of points in space, and I'll either want to cluster them, or I'll have functions on them that I want to do regression on, or classification. And what you'll do is you'll take these vector points in space, you'll somehow uh, fit a graph to the data. So you'll somehow say, this is the right graph on these points, and that's the question, of course. And then we're going to take whatever the analogous problem is and solve it on the graph. So we're going to take our bunch of points. Uh, for clustering, we'll make a graph and pick our favorite clustering algorithm for graphs. For uh, likewise, for regression and clustering for graphs, there's some very well-studied ways of solving these problems on graphs. And so we're going to just kind of lift the graph algorithms to the vector world. Um, OK, so this isn't the first time people have said graphs should be used for machine learning. And in fact, even the idea of sort of taking your data, modeling it with a graph, and then solving machine learning uh, things with it is something that's had some substantial previous work. And the way that they did it in the past was really with they really put most of the thought into what do you do once you have the graph as opposed to how to get the graph. And so their graphs were really very simple graphs. They were ones that said, take all points in a certain radius of every point and connect ones that are this, you know, less than delta apart or make a weighted graph with e to the negative something. I mean, it was very sort of take the points, write on some metric, label the weights. And unsurprisingly, different graphs give different qualities of answer. You know, if I take and really widely varying answers. And so the question I'm going to basically ask today is, what can you get out of being a little more careful? What can you get if we actually choose the graphs intelligently? So um, that's going to be the goal. Sorry, I choose the graphs with more care. I didn't mean to imply that the previous ones um, weren't. <laughs> OK, good. Yeah, this is why I shouldn't have signed that form that lets me videotape this. <laughs> um, OK. so. Um, yeah. OK, so our main question, let me rephrase that. Choose another intelligent way of finding the graphs that involves doing it with a little bit more care. OK, so this is our main question, which is, of course, the basic question here, if you're going to do this, is what graph do you use? And so we're going to start by posing the question, what is the, quote, right graph for a set of vectors in space? So OK, how am I going to do this? Well, let me first kind of give you the basic setup. Um, and then I'm going to run through a motivation. And so. Um, it's, um, there's a couple things I'm going to show as motivations. A couple things later I'll show as properties. And I think if you ask Dan Spielman or Sam or me which of these are the motivations and which of them are the properties, we tend to give different answers. Like we each have written the word motivation as a title for something involving this, and we keep writing different motivations. So I'm going to give one of them. And what's the setup? The setup is I have a bunch of points, n points in RD, and I want to somehow make a weighted graph on the vertex set given by the points. So I'll have a vertex for each point. 
And the answer should have a couple nice properties that we'll hope for. One is that it should have some theoretical motivation that makes some sense. One is that it should have nice mathematical properties. Uh, one is that it should give good solutions to the machine learning problems we actually set out to solve. You might be able to tell that I'm a computer science theorist and not a machine learning person by the fact that this was number three and not number one. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll get all of them. And you know, ideally it will be efficiently computable so you actually can use this in any reasonable setting. And efficiently in both the efficiently of poly time and the actually efficiently in practice. And it will be both. So the fact that it's number four shows you theoretical <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There's a lot. Actually, I think you can read a lot from, <laughs> from the, uh, the order I put here. Um, and number five, that should be as sparse as possible. I think this one carries less information about my personal. This one really should be number five, I guess. Um, OK, so these are some good properties. And we're going to come up with a construction that gives these. And I should say that we're going to come up with a construction. I'm not really convinced it's the construction. I think there's certain properties of it that are definitely right. But we're actually going to give two slightly different constructions. And the fact that we have two somehow indicates that we probably don't have the exact right one yet. I think that roughly we're going to minimize something subject to constraints. And I think we're minimizing the right thing. And I think the constraints we have some freedom in. And I think that getting the exact sort of right answer to that is not 100% clear yet. So that's going to be the general structure. And so, so, yeah. So the, the target machine learning problem that you're trying to solve oh, well. is known when you're trying to find the graph, or it's not known? You want to um, so it work for all future problems. So the machine learning problem, oh, so the idea here is to come up with a general construction of you have a bunch of vectors, use the template from the previous slide. Um, find your graph not using the machine learning problem itself. Just we're going to have one answer independent of the machine learning problem of vectors gives graph, and then solve graph problems. Use, you know, solve graph problems use solution for machine learning problem. That's going to be the general template. We're going to have one answer to the graph question, and really two, but not based on changing the machine learning problem. Just based on basically whether we have inequality constraints or quadratic penalties. Like it's not a huge difference, um, and just one of them turns out to be practically a lot faster to compute but not jumping ahead quite so much. The answer is we have one answer to the question, what's the right graph to describe these sets of points? I'll argue a couple reasons why I think it's a very good answer to that question. And then we'll see that it actually gives that one, using just that graph, we can get good solutions to a pretty wide array of machine learning problems. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so the outline of this is I will give you some background on things. Uh, there's a couple tools we'll need from spectral graph theory. Then I'm going to write out the construction of the graphs and give at least one reason why we chose the ones we did. Then um, I'm going to back up and give you an interpretation in terms of Laplacians and spectral graph theory, which is, I think, more of what I would consider the motivation. But I think that there's a cleaner, less technical motivation that's a better one to start with. And then I'll, come up with, I'll describe some nice properties of these graphs, some of which are a little bit surprising. At least they were to me when we found them. And I'll show it actually, these concepts have, they relate to a couple other things from uh, machine learning or from geometry. It turns out that you can view these as generalizations, a simultaneous generalization of SVDs and k-means, which I think is kind of a nice, um, nice that you have a simultaneous generalization of both of them. And I'll talk about how that's the case. And uh, then I'll get to the actual machine learning part of this, which has data. So this is at least me partially apologizing for the ordering from the previous slide, is that I actually we did this with actual data, and it does surprisingly well on it. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how to actually efficiently compute the graphs. It's going to be really not very difficult to show that you can polynomially compute the graphs. But the polynomial, uh, like it's going to be, this is a convex program. You can solve convex programs. It's not, but then I'll talk about how to actually do it in a way that makes these things practically useful. So where you can solve reasonable size problems. Then I'll sort of end with some open questions on this. Okay, so what are some background things I think you're going to need? Um, one of them is just where these graphs have been, what's been done before. And that's the sort of standard way to make a graph. And basically, I said it out loud a couple minutes ago. The idea is I give you a bunch of points, and you have really a couple cho two major choices of what the edges you have are. I guess one more is every vertex is a complete graph with weights that I didn't throw in. So you sort of choose one from each column. You either pick your k nearest neighbors, or you pick everything that's less than some threshold. And then you either don't weight the edges, or you weight them by some Usually it's either the negative distance squared with some constants. And these are where the previous constructions um, really, this is basically what was done in the previous constructions in the literature. And they have an advantage. They're easy to come up with, right? Computing these is completely trivial. You just have to compute distances. And the motivation for a lot of these is they work really nicely when you have a dense set of points on a manifold. So you know, I think the picture that motivated a lot of these was that you know, machine learning doesn't really work if you have no structure on your points. 
uh, if I just give you an arbitrary set of points in space and arbitrary properties on them, then you don't have any information. You're not going to learn anything. And so intuitively, what machine learning is going to try to aim at is you have points that have some structure. And one common structure is you have a whole bunch of points that satisfy some constraints. So they lie in some lower dimensional space, uh, manifold in the space. And then here, if you imagine that you had a really densely sampled manifold, so you have this high dimensional space, you have this slightly lower dimensional manifold, and you have a lot of points. Think exponentially many points so that you really triangulate, that they really look like the manifold, then this actually comes pretty close to giving the manifold, right? You're basically just getting a discretization. And so for that motivation, these make a lot of sense. Now, the unfortunate thing is that the actual parameter regimes where most data sets lie aren't the one I just described. They're not the case where you have huge numbers of points so that you actually really can just read off the manifold, but that you have a, once you get high dimensional spaces, the number of points you need grows pretty quickly to get that to make any sense. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to give some, and then the analogy starts to break. And so what I'm going to do here is show how to sort of take some of the ideas that would um, come from this manifold world as one possible motivation, but do them in a way that you don't really rely on such a dense sampling assumption. This is at least one intuition of it. And you know, another way of viewing this is that one of the basic uh, machine learning tenets that one sort of starts with is that if you want to answer a question, you should sort of only learn what you need to know to answer the question. And in some sense, if you're asking the question, what is this whole manifold, you're learning more than you need if you just want to cluster your points or solve a regression problem. And so one view of, in my mind of why these graphs are actually working pretty well is they're really learning a lot less information. They're not trying to learn the whole manifold. They're actually learning, as we'll see, really just a norm on the space of functions. And it's going to be just a graph. It's going to have many fewer parameters, as we'll see. And so it's going to give something where we're really we're cutting down the number of dimensions we're trying to learn by a lot, which is what I think gives us a lot of the fact, a lot of our ability to sort of avoid overfitting and get good empirical performance. OK, so what else? So now this, I'm going to phrase all this in terms of Laplacian. So I should tell you what Laplacians are. Raise your hand if you've seen a graph Laplacian before. Um, OK, so I'll do this existently, but not, um, but fairly quickly. Um, I'm going to, by the way, in general, I'm going to probably accelerate as the talk goes on, possibly slow me down if I accelerate too much. OK, so a, um, I actually kept um, Madhu from giving me coffee. So hopefully, this will at least be somewhat controlled. But um, it's hard to tell. Dan said exactly the same thing. You have one video tape. Yeah, he didn't involve the entire community before doing so. <laughs> so, um, OK. You make the same remark after. OK, good. So here's a weighted graph. Um, we're going to have a Laplacian matrix. And Laplacian, formally, it just says you give me a graph, you give me its adjacency matrix A. Um, I'll give you this other matrix D, which is just a diagonal matrix of weighted degrees. So its i diagonal entry is the degree of the ith vertex. We'll define L to be D minus A. So there. You know, so for example, if you looked at the vertex, I don't know, 3. 3 has edges of um, the third. This is corresponds to the third row. It has edges of um, maybe a typo or two. but. Mm, this was the wrong time, time to have a typo, but did I get it right? Um, three. OK, good. Right. So I even did it right. OK, good. Um, it's, it's symmetric, but yeah, um, row or column. But it's got, um, it's got edges to um, three of weight three and negative three and negative one. Those correspond to the entries of the adjacency matrix. And then the diagonal entries are the degrees of the graph, the weighted degrees. OK, so this is the, I think, less insightful way of viewing it. The way that it's going to be more useful for us is to view it either as a quadratic or linear form. So before I get to that, one kind of useful fact that we'll use later when we try to compute these things is that there's a way to factor it in a reasonable way as a product of matrices. So what we'll do is we'll write it as U, W, U transpose, where W is a diagonal matrix of the weights of the edges. So U is going to be, um, it's going to be edge by vertex or vertex by edge, depending whether you have the transpose in it. So this is a, so here this is going to be an N by M where m is the number of edges, then m by m, then m by n. And this is the edge vertex incidence matrix. So it has edges corresponding to the um, each of the columns corresponds to an edge, and each of the vertices gives you a row. And you have a 1 and a negative 1 for the two entries corresponding to the edge. And the sign won't matter because we're sort of squaring it anyway. So it doesn't matter whether you do one negative 1 or the other way around. And the useful fact is that you can factor it as u, w, u transpose. This gives us some nice computational properties. It also immediately tells us it's positive semi-definite, which is nice to know. OK, so here's the way I want to um, interpret it. One way is as a quadratic form. We're actually, and this is kind of the standard one you'll see a lot, which is um, if you look at what x transpose Lx is, it turns out if you expand out all the terms and what I just wrote, it has this very nice form. 
It says you think of x as a function on the vertices. So it has n entries and there's n vertices. So it's nth entry. Its ith entry is the ith vertex, corresponds to the ith vertex. And then what you do is you add up over all edges. You look at the difference between the value on one ed, end point and the other end point. You square it and you weight them by the, vertex, by the edge weights. So you can think of this as an energy. Um, the idea is you think of springs as having, think of every edge as a spring and think of the x's as kind of nailing your graph down on the line and then this is the energy where the weights are the spring constants. Um, and this is a nice picture because it somehow says when you do things with the Laplacian, you can think of them as minimizing some energy and so it gives a nice interpretation of why minimizing stuff with Laplacians tends to give sort of reasonable answers to questions of fitting things. Um, there's another less common view that's actually going to come up here, which is as a linear map. And so instead of viewing it as a quadratic form, we're going to view it as a linear function. Um, so we're sort of going to erase that. And the idea here, if you look at what this does, we'll see that the ith coordinate of Lx, if you kind of just write out what that means, it says that what you do is you take the value on the ith vertex and you subtract the weighted average of its neighbors. Um, and then there's um, a scaling. This is this over, I should have put a wi in here. Um, so there's a typo other than the normalization. This is for the normalized Laplacian, which I am not using. But other than the normalization factor, this is what it's doing. So it, it's, it's weighted by the degree that I didn't write. And it says what you're asking is, what is the, you take the average of all your neighbors and you take your value and you see how close you are to the average of your neighbors. Um, and note that if you apply this, to, you can do this sort of to multiple columns at once. So imagine doing this instead of putting an x here, put a bunch of x's, you know, a bunch of vectors. Think of it as a, higher a point in a higher dimensional space. And then now it's just doing, it's replacing, uh, it's just putting in L2 norms instead of squares. So here, I got it right. It says that, you know, the, in particular, the Frobenius norm of Lx um, squared is the, you take the, all the points, their neighbors, you add them up, you add up the norms of the difference between the points and their neighbors. Okay, so that's our background on Laplacians. Um, this is, oh, you're looking, you're just telling us what the Frobenius norm of the resulting vector right. is. Now, there's a good reason to see this, um, which is that, you know, first, if you ignore this, this says sum over all vertices. What this asks is how much do vertices tend to differ from the average of their neighbors, right? So this is, other than the weighting by the degree, this is the, the vector value at the ith, corresponding to the ith vertex. This is the average of the neighbors. And so these are two points in space, and we're looking how far the vertex is from the centroid of its neighbors weighted with the appropriate weights. So this is actually a good thing. I might want to make a comment now. This kind of is going to be part of our motivation, which is that this norm, if I had a nice smooth manifold with a huge number of samples, should be really small if I were to do this to the actual coordinates of the points. Because once you get really close, you know, on a really small scale, the thing sort of linearizes, and then points tend to be exa almost exactly the average of their neighbors. So one of the motivations of some of our construction is that at least if we got this dead on right, if we had this with a, in this case we don't really have, with huge numbers of samples, this would be a quantity that should be small for a nicely fit graph, um, where the graph is a triangulation of the manifold. So if x is the data and l is the Laplacian of your graph, that would be small. Right, so in some sense, this is going to be our objective function that we're going to minimize, more or less. Um, okay, so now let me actually tell you what the graphs are, and let me give some reasons why I chose them. It turns out that there's some, there's some flexibility in the answer, but not complete flexibility. And if you change some things, it works great. If you change some things, it gives really bad answers, and let me explain why. Okay, so here's the motivation. Um, I'm now going to jump forward and talk about a machine learning problem for motivation. I will pick one of them that's nice, which is regression. Um, so I'm going to motivate this by saying, let's say we wanted to use a graph to solve regression. What graph would make that make sense? Um, so let me think of the sort of easiest possible regression problem just to motivate our graph construction. It's going to say, I'll give you points, and I'll give you a function on each point. And I'm going to tell you all the values but one. So I'm just going to have one point missing, and I'm going to want to try to figure out what the right value is at the point. Um, so it's regression and sort of n minus 1 labeled points and one empty one. So, you know, what do you do? Well, you're given y, some vector y, which is f of x sub i at each of the i's, and you want to figure out the one missing point. So if I gave you a graph, let's not think of vectors. If I gave you a graph, there's sort of an obvious thing to do in some ideological sense. It says you should just take the average of your neighbors, right? If I tell you I've labeled all your neighbors with numbers, what's, the value, what's your value, and you have weights on your edges, there's only one really natural thing to do, which conveniently looks a lot like a Laplacian. So, um, okay, so... In that case, let's look at what, one thing you might want to say is let's just minimize the size of this. Let's put a square on it because squares are nicer than not, we need absolute values and absolute values stink, so we'll use squares. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And this is what our sum of squares of errors is. So imagine what we did is we sort of left out of, we imagine kind of leaving out one value for each i and then added it up over i's and we get something that looks like this. 
So what I want to say is one, one way to imagine constructing the right graph is to say, let's use the actual coordinate functions, the things that give us our points in space, as the, um, as the functions. And we're going to try to make a graph so that if we were to try to sort of interpolate the coordinates themselves using the graph, we would get something reasonable. So the idea is that we're going to try to make it, you know, back to the manifold picture, that says you know, we're trying to make the actual coordinates lay the manifold out in space, and we're going to make a graph so that if you were to take a point as the weighted average of its neighbors, we'd get pretty close to the actual manifold we started with. So we're going to try to get this right in coordinate vectors. And so this kind of tells us what to do. We'll take this value, we'll sum it over all the d coordinate vectors, then we'll sum it over all the points, and we'll minimize it. And if you were to simplify it out a bit, you know, you get, we can write this in vector notation so we, don't, we can at least lose one summation because we're just adding up L2 norms. And we get something nice, and we can choose the edge weights that minimize it. So the xi's are given, and the wij is what you're trying to Exactly. Do. So it's a little backwards than usual. We're trying to find the graph, which is what makes these things not so linear sometimes and a little weirder. But you know, the idea is we're trying to find the graph, we're given the points in space that we were trying to fit to. So the x's are the data, and the w's are what we're solving for. So there's a couple issues with this, which is that it just doesn't work really, um, empirically or theoretically. Um, so one is that it's a non-convex problem. It turn, you know, basically the point of why it's not at least obviously convex is that here, when you change the weights, the degrees change and they're in denominators and that's not fun. So if, um, if you were kind of, for some reason, you could uh, restrict yourself to a regular graph, you wouldn't have this issue? Um, in some sense, yes, you have to be careful because you know, in some sense, what we're doing here is we're making a regular graph by renormalizing all the edges. You have to, so we'll see in a sec. Basically, the degrees are the only thing that we have to worry about. If how to deal with the degree, how to deal with restricting the degrees. So the answer was yes. The answer is yes, as long as you're. A, but you have to be a little careful in how best to do it. Like, what you minimize and what your constraints are um, are a little flexible. And it turns out, exactly regular has its mild negatives, but basically yes. Um, so, ninety-nine percent yes. The other Laplacian, right, if it's not regular. Um, so, in, um, so the normalized Laplacian, in some sense, the actual upshot of what I'm going to get to is that this is the thing that's going to correspond to the normalized Laplacian. And if we use the actual non-normalized Laplacian, we'll get the thing that will behave even better. So now the normalized Laplacian here is the thing that says divide by degrees. And that's going to ca cause all the problems. So I can give away my punchline, which is we're going to use the regular Laplacian and we're going to put lower bounds on degrees. If the degrees were regular, then you could solve the optimization problem easily, but it may not give you the best graph. Um, That's what you're trying to say. I mean, the degrees are, the degrees are functions of the weights. Right. right. But if so you fix them to some fixed If I set them all to be one, right. I'd actually get a decent graph. It's going to have, basically the only reason we didn't do this is it's going to take a line and it's going to try to make a regular graph out of a bunch of vertices in a line and it will give it a circle. That's really the only reason why you don't want dead regular graphs is that certain things don't look right with regular graphs because they have boundaries. Other than that, the, we could have just solved this by making all the degrees one. Um, and what we're really going to do is make them at least one. So yeah. OK, good. So it gives a non-convex non problem, and it actually gives bad behaviors. Like it's going to give a kind of weird answer to a certain question. So let's try to minimize this just so we see why it's not just you know, non-convexity. Sometimes you can still solve it. But let's see why this actually has the wrong structure anyway. And the example is, OK, this is not the example. If I do this, there's only, you know, this is, this is the answer you get. That's really the only thing you can get, right? Like, what else would you get? But if I were to add that one point in the middle, it turns out that you get a weird answer. And the reason is that I claim if you look at this, um, by symmetry, it really should look, it will look like this. And it really should just by symmetry, there's nothing, no other thing you can imagine it looking like. And it turns out that as epsilon gets smaller, your objective function gets strictly better. Because, um, you know, and, and intuitively what's happening is that there's no, nothing that makes, yes, for this vertex, we're scaling it. So even if these are epsilons, it's still getting a contribution of one. But the problem is, is that there's nothing that keeps you from make, but this vertex confuses these vertices, right? Like you're always happier to be the sum of these two than when you throw this in for a convex hull. And so if there's nothing that forces, you know, if there's, there's no reason to make epsilon non-negligible, because this vertex, no matter what you do, is going to have a zero. And then this just tends to make epsilon go to zero, and you just get an isolated point, which is really not great. Like, I think it's fairly clear looking at this picture that these edges should exist. I don't know what the right weight is by just glancing at it, but at least they, have to, they shouldn't be zero. So this turns out to be a kind of strange graph, and you can actually make it even worse. You can actually get 
examples with different variables going to zero. They can have different rates that they approach zero, even asymptotically, and it's kind of an ill-behaved question. And so the upshot is that we'll just fix it by not dividing by anything and using the regular Laplacian. And I claim this is actually even a better idea in, um, in basically all ways. Um, and so what we'll do is we're going to replace this by just the Laplacian itself. So we're going to multiply through by the degrees. And we'll look at the sum of the squares of errors weighted by degree. Now there's one problem with it, which is that now the optimum is zero. Like there's no reason to put any weight at all because everything goes down together. So we'll have to somehow not make it degenerate. You might want to say fix some sum of something. That turns out not to be what you want to do because you really want when you're solving a machine learning problem, you want to be able to talk about all the points, right? Like just because some point makes your fitting problem not solve well, there's not a really great idea to just say then we're going to make all the edges small and not penalize it in any way, you know, try to make it not matter. So sometimes what we really want is you want a, a graph to be well behaved structurally at all points on the graph. Yeah? So, so what prevents you from just making a big self loop uh, on every vertex that has degree di? Again, uh, nothing yet. Right now, I haven't. Um, so right now, I haven't actually. Well, okay. So the first answer is I'm not going to allow self loops. Um, but the second answer is I haven't given constraints yet. So right. So you can ask the question now, um, which is um, we're going to give this constraint and we're going to make edges not be self loops. Um, so self loops don't really help us much in any case because they say like you should interpolate a function with its own value, which is it's not a helpful piece of information, really. Um, it, it was a problem that you showed just now, right? I mean, did, uh, did you have this extra point? I mean, um, I mean, what you want is you want every vertex to really have, you know, what intuitively we're going to try to make it that um, the, this graph captures the structure of whatever, whatever the real space is. And you want to make it that every vertex is required, like sort of, Intuitively, you want every vertex to sort of incur roughly the same scale of penalty. So you have to get all the vertices equally right. And you can't sort of win by trading off parts of graphs for other parts. Because just because you want some of your points to be less important than others doesn't mean geometrically there's any reason they should be. Um, so, well, give me a sec, but, um, so roughly the point was that we're going to make all the points have some lower bound on their contribution, say 1. It's basically constraining the graph to be regular. And the only reason we're going to constrain it to be, so if I made this equal, it would be regular. We're constraining it to be a little more than regular because really just so you can have boundary. Um, and then, but that's basically the constraint on those. Your question? So, well, are there other assumptions of something coming here or, okay. Um, so there's going to be two of them. Okay, because I mean, I, just to continue with David's question. So if each point had sort of a twin, which was epsilon away from it. Right. It would seem that the solution, that the solution would be that which guy is gets big one with the twin. And um, the no, one. because imagine I gave you, let me think, let's, that for example, imagine I gave you a really fine sampling of a line. Okay. Now, um, you know, so I could imagine twinning, you know, thinking, or I could give you a weird sampling of a line, right? I could imagine two points, two points, two points really close to each other. The point is that the goal isn't to, the goal is to make you be the average of your neighbors. The points on the line really have a strong incentive to pick both of their neighbors, right? Like they want to be the average. So for example, if I gave you points lined up on a line, the best thing to do is actually to pick your weight so that you're exactly the weighted average of your neighbors. And so you don't want to just pick small. Like small is better than not small. But the real thing you're trying to, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to approximate um, linearity in some sense. Not, you're not trying to approximate small, like nearbyness. Um, yeah? So, suppose you have like, um, like a torus. If you, I mean, you know, when you, so the things that you, if you sample in a non-uniform way, I mean, if your sample is sort of non-uniform, then you, you might sort of do sort of very low, low dimensional things, which are not. I mean, it, for a torus in particular, you'll actually do. So, OK, at a certain point, the torus stops looking like a torus if you sample it too coarsely. You know. But once you sample it enough that it really has any torus-like structure, then you can think of it as a product of two circles, and the circles really do work. And so you'll actually get, you will actually, for the torus, get pretty good behavior. I'll show some examples in a second. But the point is, this doesn't want degenerate behavior. What it really wants is, it really wants um, it, 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 this doesn't encourage you to use really small weights or degenerate things. It encourages you to actually find sort of appropriate local structure. Um, if you sample anything too coarsely, you'll eventually get junk just because you start, like a torus and a sphere can be the same thing if you sample three points. But once you get enough that the structure really exists, this, this will do pretty well with a torus, actually. So, I mean, just like so you, you put very, uh, I mean, uh, like a bunch of uh, circles, very finely sampled, and you put them a bit further, I mean, you put them next to each other, but a bit uh, further away than... So actually, the changing the sampling rate, I have a really good answer to. 
which is conformal invariance of the Laplacian. So as long as you have enough, so one of the other motivations of this is that as long as, <coughs> if you do it coarsely enough, the structure doesn't exist, then I guess the structure doesn't exist. But if you play with, if you try to do things like that, where you sort of locally make things closer and farther, that actually you can't really break things with it because of the conformal invariance of the Laplacian. It behaves very well with scaling, like with changing your sampling rate. Um, as long as, so that actually has, it behaves very well under that answer. Um, so let me give some pictures and then I'll come back to this. Um, just, I, I, it's going to help to have some examples before I try to wave my hands at examples. Um, so just to give a, let me just give the other definition, I should say. There's a couple, you know, this was maybe a little aggressive. So you could say we want degrees to not be too small. We could strictly uh, make the total degree of every vertex at least one. Or we could say we want them to be at least one and we'll penalize them if they're not. You know, so this is, just the, this is just a quadratic penalty function that says you could have vertices with lower degree, but we'll just charge you for them. And it's just a, so we're calling this the soft graph and that the hard graph. Mm -hmm. It's just whether you impose your constraints hard, as a hard constraint or as a, an inequality with a penalty. Is there a value of alpha which would correspond to the above? Or um, I mean, it's um, one's an inequality, one's a penalty. So if alpha is zero, do I say, am I saying that everything is? Um, okay. So if alpha is zero, then the di is at exactly. Uh, one. Or, or, yeah. So I mean, okay. I mean, then then yes. Um, I guess as you said, alpha is zero. But and uh, by the way, I was going to say one of the things that's nice about our construction is that if you look at a lot of the other things that you deal with, there's a lot of parameters. If you support vector machines, you know, you have a lot of choices. Here, I was going to say there's no choices. This is all pretty much choiceless. There's one choice, which is alpha. Um, but I claim it's not a fitting parameter. I claim alpha can be 0.1 for the rest of your life. Um, so really, this is a non-parametric construction, other than this one number for this. And 0.1 is the answer. We don't fit it. Um, so in, in the larger the alpha, the more softer the graph is Exactly. Getting. Like, the less you penalize. Uh -huh. Um, I mean, it's really not that sensitive to it. The real benefit of, of hard versus soft in these things is that this is going to turn out to be much easier to compute because it's going to have a nicer structure for some optimization. Yeah. So why do you put this constraint? I mean, if you already want to do soft, why not add this with the coefficient alpha to your convex optimization problem? Add that, OK. So you can either constrain the sum of di smaller than 1 to be smaller equal than alpha mm -hmm. n, or you can say, well, in the end, I'm optimizing something. I want mm -hmm. to make the square norm smaller, or whatever. So I would actually optimize whatever you will optimize plus alpha times the um, sum. I mean, it's basically equivalent, right? Like, I mean, uh, you'll see it a couple of slides. I mean, this is where I said, so the two answers to that one are that specific one is going to be pretty much equivalent up to slightly changing what alpha you're, you know, my, my version and your version will give the same graph, although possibly with a slightly different alpha. Um, you know, so that is one answer to it. The other answer, because you're just penalizing a total, a total. The other answer to it is that there are some other variations of this that I think make sense. Um, this is the part where I said I'm not sold on having the right answer because I have two reasonable constraints. I'm pretty sold on the objective function. These are two reasonable constraints that give good performance and have the right qualitative properties. If I were to say what's the part I'm not sure, the fact that I have two of them is something that at least argues that I don't have the right, that I don't have a complete answer to what is the dead on right constraint. But these are sort of two very plausible ways of keeping the general structure. And you'll see the answer, the actual performance is not for most things, it doesn't really matter which of the constraints you choose. There really is a right enough answer that these two graphs differ in only a very small amount of, of, of weight on edges. OK, so here's some pictures, just so we see some nice properties. Here's a picture of, I put a bunch of random points in two dimensions. The width of an edge corresponds to the weight. There's one surprising property of this, which is that it's a planar graph. And right, I took a bunch of points in space, and I fit a graph to them by minimizing something. And there's no a priori reason why I shouldn't have crossing edges. Um, and if you do a bunch of simulations, you'll see the answer is that this always happens. And in fact, um, it will be a theorem, um, which we'll come to in a sec. Yeah, well, so we have, we have a theorem to that extent, which I'll come to. Um, the other thing I want to, and this is for both graphs. So wait, uh, you didn't tell us which edges you were putting in here. Yeah, you just told us how to compute weights of the edges of the Right, so then I said minimize the, minimize the Laplacian. So the norm, the thing we had, the, norm, the sum of the. So, so it turns out to be sparse. So, so, so it's you're not really a complete yes. graph. So the right. So, so it's the underlying so it's exactly graph. Find the, so exactly what we'll do is we'll minimize that expression subject to this constraint. Right. So um, so or that one. But the j adjacent to i, every j is right. adjacent to i. Right. So here, yeah, so you could think of this as just all ij. Okay. Um, but, but, and what we'll see that's going to be surprising is that we're going to get not the complete graph, we're going to get sparse graphs, and we're going to get nice structure, like planarity for planar graphs. Yeah? 
since you mentioned springs, Tut had an algorithm that uh, puts a similar quadratic function, minimizes right. motivated by springs, and gives a planar embedding. Right, so this is somehow flipping the order around. Right? Like, the, you know, he's starting with the graph and finding an embedding here. We're somehow starting with the okay. embedding and finding the graph. Okay. But um, the same intuition holds, which is that, like, things look nicer when their springs are small energy. I mean, it's a reasonable geometric picture. So, it, you know, I mean, sometimes he also just did the, I mean, also this energy is just the norm of the Laplacian, so uh, times a vector. So, you know, it's, again, these are, Right. Okay, so the, um, this is one picture that I think is surprising. Note the degree is small, and is, it's not a dense graph. It's sparse. It looks like a planar graph. Um, the outer structure is not uh, convex. So right, it's not going to be convex. And the reason, in some sense, the boundary nodes don't, they're a little finicky. But we'll come back to it. Here's another picture. If I have two clusters, note that it tends to cluster with the clusters. Um, as these things go off to infinity, these weights will get smaller, but it does have non-negligible weight between these because there is at least some incentive to connect points that are any kind of distance apart like this. The thickness of the edge the weight? Yes. Um, it was just my best attempt at drawing fairly dense, you know, fairly large graphs. So thickness corresponds to weight, so thicker. So here, for example, if you wanted to partition it, you actually would get good cut ratios from the obvious thing. Um, here's another picture. It's hmm. nice. Um, another thing that's nice about it, note that it did actually it captured the fact that these things are sort of arranged in circles as opposed to giving you a grid, like a sort of naive grid. It also captured scale in some relevant way, which is my conformal comment, which is that no, these are lighter than mm -hmm. these. Um, and also it, it only barely wanted to use the orthogonal directions. So there's some nice pictures that say this is pretty, is at least empirically well behaved. And I'm gonna prove a couple theorems about why. I might accelerate and sketch a couple theorems. Um, but, okay, so yeah. Um, no. So, we actually conjectured they're always connected. They're usually connected. Um, you can actually come up with cases, carefully constructed concentric ring type things where they end up not being connected, which we found a little surprising. Um, I guess there's no obvious reason why they should be connected because sometimes you have disconnected things. We thought that there was, we, we actually were surprised by this. Um, you know, I think in our original paper, the paper was a couple years ago. In the original paper, I think we wrote, we think this might be connected, and then someone else wrote us back saying no. So, you know, it, there's, it's plausible that it was connected, but it turns out not to be the case. Um, it roughly looks like it's, in, it's a planar graph. It's a planar set of points that actually can break it. So, anyway, yeah, that, I d that was a little surprising. I guess there's no reason it should be connected. It just turns out to have, there's a benefit to having some edges. Usually, if there's multiple points, there's some benefit to using them, but yeah. Okay, so in terms of the graph of Laplacian, we can write out what all this is. Um, I'm just going to kind of run through this quickly. So in, um, the inferring thing I did with the regression, you can think of it as minimizing the energy X transpose LX. That was exactly what we wrote before. Um, so um, our graph construction is minimizing somewhat weirdly, not X transpose LX, but Lx is norm squared, so xl lx. And sometimes we're picking up an extra l, right? So the natural thing that one might think would be an xlx, but we're not. We're doing xl squared x, basically. Um, and at first, that might seem weird, but I claim it's actually very well, very reasonable. Um, and the reason I would say th that this is reasonable is that, in some sense, these are two separate questions. One of them says, learn the graph. The other says, using the graph, solve a regression problem. So first, there's no reason they should be the same thing. Secondly, the idea here is that what we're trying to do, we're trying to, here we're trying to say vertices should be the average of their neighbors. The way you make a function sort of smooth is you minimize the difference between vertices and the average of the, and, you know, and their neighbors, minimize springs. Whereas here, we're saying we want to graph where things are the average of their neighbors. So now instead of using the quadratic form, we're using the linear form. And the linear form here, Lx, is precisely the difference between each vertex and the average of its neighbors, so we take the norm of Lx. So this is why I claim that the quadratic is very reasonable. The fact that we have these two different expressions, one is finding the graph, the other is using it, and they, one we want to really use it as a quadratic form the, to evaluate an energy, the other we want to use it to sort of evaluate our actual graph itself. Um, note this is quadratic. Um, the thing we had before was this. This turned out to correspond to the normalized Laplacian, as you pointed out. Um, the D inverse is just weird. Um, it really, I mean, it's just, it, it turns out, the more I think about it, the more I think I shouldn't have written it there in the first place, because... Time. But, well, the normalized Laplacian is sometimes a good idea. Right. Um, in some sense, if I gave you a graph, the normalized, or gave you an object, the normalized Laplacian is well behaved because it makes the, it deals with the irregular graphs. Yeah. The problem here is essentially, 
you don't want, you want to say, make your vertices all have non-negligible contributions and then make a graph that encapsulates that. What this is doing is it's sort of, it's saying we're going to make all the contributions the same by letting them do whatever they want and then just scaling their contributions. So if, for example, I took one vertex and I played with its weight, um, it doesn't change the actual value of any of these quantities because we're then dividing by the weight. Like the degree really, we want to make a graph that tries to minimize the right expression without, we want the rescaling to happen when you use the quadratic form, not when you find the quadratic form or else this is just weirdly degenerate. Because if I were to sort of shift all the weights up, the entire objective function stays identical. So it's just an oddly behaved quantity. You should try to avoid denominators in general. Yeah. Um, fractions are confusing. Um, okay, so let me tell you some nice mathematical properties quickly. Um, one is that it may be unique, um, but it's not always. So just to point out, the first thing one might assert is uniqueness. That's not true, and we've already essentially proven it. Um, I'll show you the proof very quickly in a bit, but roughly when things are symmetric, you'll have a bunch of choices. Um, and we'll see why in a bit. Um, but in practice, it's often unique. When things don't have sort of really highly, highly symmetric properties, they tend to be unique. Um, this may or may not be a theorem. So we believe, but it's, not, it's less trivial than you'd think because of the structure of the space, that if you perturb your inputs by a in random infinitesimal that you get unique with probability one. That seems true. We haven't tried that hard to prove it, but I claim at least your first immediate proof is probably not completely right, so it's not completely vacuous. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now, um, just because I think I'm running a little slow. But th this, I think, is probably true. Um, it's not, things aren't as linear as they would be because we're playing with the graph, so the thing that involves looking at points on polytopes directly is not going to work. But I think it's probably doable and maybe not super hard. Um, but we don't have a proof. Okay, now we get to the more interesting true property, which is sparse solutions. So my assertion is that, okay, in general, we don't, know, we don't have sparsity. Like if I gave you n points in Rn in a, on the uniform simplex, the only answer you can hope for is the simplex, right? Mm -hmm. So you should have, that's the complete graph on, n, you know, on the, the points, so that's that, right? I mean, but, but why, you shouldn't expect sparsity because high dimensional things should have you know, edges that grow with the dimensionality. What you would hope for though is that if I was going to say that this sort of captures a lot of the properties of these lower dimensional things and somehow gets all the benefits of manifold learning things without having to really learn the manifold, you'd hope that if I gave you intrinsically low dimensional things, whether they actually live in a low dimensional space or they locally look low dimensional, you'd hope that then the sparsity will be small. Um, and it turns out that's the case. So what we're going to show is that, I'll show this for the, uh, the case that you have all your points in a low dimensional space, you'll actually get sparse solutions where the density is going to where it's going to be a constant, the degree will be a constant times the dimension of the space, the average degree. So the basic point is just counting constraints, which is that let's say I fix LX um, and I fix the weighted average degrees. Mm -hmm. um, the point here is that if we count constraints, if I have a bunch of points in RD, this is n times d plus 1 constraints, um, and I have more than, if I have more than n times d plus 1 non-zero entries, and this many constraints, I've got a direction I can go while keeping the objective function identical and the degrees identical. So I have some freedom, and so if, if so I can at so least make one of them smaller. Um, yeah, so this is not guaranteeing non-uniqueness necessarily, because I haven't showed that this happens for the minimum, because often the minimum will want to make a lot of things zero. And in fact, here what I'm really arguing is just if I give you a dense solution, if it's, I can make a sparse solution that is no worse. Um, but it probably will be better because probably you don't want to exactly move along the line. You want to do something using you know, a little bit more of your freedom. But the point is just that you can knock all your coordinates. You know, just by counting dimensions, if one of your things is non-zero, you have a direction you can move without changing anything, and therefore there exists a sparse answer. And just so by counting it, what you get is that if I have n vectors in Rd, the graph has at most d plus 1 times n edges. So that's kind of nice. So these pretty pictures of the planar embeddings that you showed us, were there embeddings which were not? Not in the ones I showed you. Okay. Um, the ones I showed you, they were unique because they were random points and um, that actually for planar graphs really does work. The symmetric one, for example. Oh, I think that that one, my, I think that that one actually is also unique, um, but I won't swear to it because it's been a while since I made the picture. Actually, it's been a while since Dan's grad student made the picture, so I really don't want to swear to it. But um, yeah, so I shouldn't, okay, good. So the, um, anyway, the point is, is that these things actually tend to be unique most of the time. It's pretty hard to make non-unique ones. Um, but the point is that, because you know, usually you do want to max out your constraints. You want to hit the boundary and you want to make things zero. Mm -hmm. um, and this actually shows that, you know, this is nice. It says that we're looking for sort of finding structure. And this says if you have low dimensionality, it finds it. And that's at least one nice property. 
Um, in practice, we actually seem to even be outperforming this by a lot. Um, roughly, if things even have, there's probably more structure than that. Um, and it sort of finds low dimensionality without you explicitly even defining the notion of dimensionality, which is a nice point. Um, and I should say there always exists an approximate low degree solution. This is just because graphs can be sparsified. Not a deep observation, but it does have the benefit of saying that if what you do is you want to find this graph and then use it a lot, then you can find an almost as good graph that's sparse, and it will mean that at least computationally for solving your machine learning problems on the graph, you can get away with sparse graphs. Okay, so now let me give the example where the graphs are not unique. Um, and the basic point is symmetry. So what we'll do is we'll take all the even points, the even parity points on the unit cube as our vector set. And the basic point is uh, this. It's that if I give you the sum of any two solutions to the equation, it's also a solution because all the numbers stay the same. So these, and therefore the sum has to be, you know, basically everything has to be preserved by the isomorphisms of the set. Uh, so therefore every vertex you can check has degree at least you choose two. So just by symmetry, um, there has to exist a solution with you know, the most symmetrical solution has to have degree d choose 2. Um, but I also showed you that there is a solution of size 2d two plus, two plus 1 because it lives in d-dimensional space. d choose 2 doesn't usually equal 2d plus 1, so there's at least two of them. Okay, so that's my proof. And sometimes you really can't have sparsity and symmetry is the basic point. And since we know that you can have symmetrical things and you can know they can be sparse, then we run into trouble. Okay, so now let me draw a picture for planarity. And this is, um, the planarity is a special case of a more general fact. So the special case is that if I give you points in the plane for either of the two graphs, you get planar graphs back, which is another piece of evidence that this is a decently run construction. Um, you can actually show other properties, like no point is contained, you have no isolated point contained in a triangular face. And in fact, in general, this is the nice fact, you actually get a simplicial complex of the dimension of the ambient space. So it's going to be the same proof with more notation. Um, and so that actually says that at least we're trying to do this in, in real life, we're not going to be in this nice manifold setting. This at least says when you're in the manifold setting, we did this right. When you're in the setting where I have this really nice manifold and I really sampled it a lot, we get something well behaved. And in fact, we actually end up with the Laplace, the operator Laplacian on the manifold. It does do what it should. Also, I did, I missed that. I thought that your original result was that it's always planar, not if the points lie in two dimensions. No, so in general, it's not always planar. And the reason is just, for example, if I gave you the unit simplex, um, you shouldn't, yeah. you, the, on, the only answer you can get by symmetry is the unit is simplex. The is the, so okay. what you want is that it learns the dimensionality of the actual data set. And so if the data set is low dimensional, right, the whole goal here is to sort of understand your structure. If you don't have structure, you shouldn't make it up. Like, right, but it's but, bizarre even that in two dimensions it. Right, and so what you really have is if it lives in d-dimensional space, you have a, a degree oh, uh, 2d plus 1 graph. So for things with low dimensional structure, and you can do this locally too, with low degree structure, you get low degree graph. Like with low dimensional structure, you find it with low degree graphs. So, so, so how many points do you have to sample as a function of the dimension in a, for a low degree manifold? I mean, you have some. Well, so I mean, I guess I mean to get the manifold right, uh -huh. a lot. I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, the for, to get this to work, the answer is many, many fewer. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess it depends on what you want to do to actually do manifold learning. It depends on how well you do it. Mm -hmm. I guess is the I, I have to be careful in this crowd because the people here do non-trivial algorithms for this. The, you know, the trivial ones, a lot. The non-trivial ones, a fair number. Um, but at least it grows, n yeah? Um, sorry, I mean, maybe I should know the answer to this, but I didn't get it. So if you just had a 2D data set and you mm -hmm. ran your algorithm, and then you tried to do the regression to figure out the first point, would you get it with very, very low error? Or if I gave you a bunch of points in our chain? I mean, like, the function, the regression function is y equals x1. First point. Yeah, so yes, because in some sense, that's what we're minimizing, right? And then you get it with zero error, or would you get some error to um, in a 2D case, um, you won't get dead on zero error because you have a boundary. Um, yeah, like, I mean, the problem is the boundary, you can't, if I have a convex set, then all the extreme points, if I have points that are not in the convex hell of other points, you can't have that value zero because they'll, you're writing things as convex combinations of the neighbors, but you'll have very low error. So if you were in high dimensions and the regression function was easy, it was some poor... Um, I mean, the answer is you're never really going to get zero because you tend to have boundary. You, you get more boundary in high dimensions. Sounds like you may do badly in high dimensions. Um, no, you had a thousand points and you're well, so, one of the coordinates. Right, so the point is that you're not, you're not trying to take the sphere and get the sphere. You're trying to take the sphere and, like, if I gave you, um, you know, sort of a, a cube or a sphere, and I just gave you the two to, end two to the n points that are the cube vertices, they could be either one. Right. You can't hope to get that dead on right with that number of points. What you can hope to do is learn the adjacency structure of the cube that says that if you wanted to predict anything, the information you have says that this vertex is an average of its neighbors. 
that's all you can really hope for. Like for the sphere, you're going to have this, like for boundary points, there's a certain amount of wrongness you're stuck with. Um, you actually will get the right, you'll get good answers. Um, you, you get the best answer you can hope for in the formulation where you're solving the problems by minimizing Laplacian. Because anytime you make a graph Laplacian for vertices on the boundary of a convex set, this thing is going to try to minimize things slightly wrong. Um, you'll, right, like, you know, and, and there's no, nothing that has the same type signature that will work better. It will work perfectly for that. But it will at least do the most reasonable thing, which is it will say that if I give you a bunch of points on the sphere, it will try to at least, it will use the sort of, it will use the estimate that's about the best you can do, given that there's sort of a bunch, it, it will take the, it will work like the convex hull more than the sphere. Um, because that's all you really know. And in high dimensions with huge, very small number of points, there is a limit on what you can hope for. Um, but what the point, but then uh, you should think of it more as a norm on functions. And this says that a nice smooth function, even on the sphere, it should tend to, you know, it should tend to roughly have nearby points be average of their neighbors. There's a limit to what you can hope for at all um, if you give you many, many fewer points. But empirically, this behaves very well because you usually, you should be thinking not fully, in, in high dimensional space, really, you don't have much structure at all if you have a small number of points unless they live in some locally lower dimensional substructure. It's so, so um, yeah, I have not dimensional shells. I have to accelerate it to get to them, but I do have them. So let me accelerate it to get them. So the idea of the proof, just for the planarity and other thing, is a local, it's just a local proof. It says if I have an optimum, I can get a better one. So if I have an optimum with an edge crossing, I can do this. I can take the little boundary of the thing, and I can increase those and decrease those, and I'll make the LX stay exactly the same while making the weighted degrees go up. So if I find the solution with maximal weighted degree, it will be planar. Um, so you're making a conjecture about a general form of this planarity. So maybe in like higher dimensional space, what you will get is a subset of the triangulation. Right, so you get a simplicial complex, which is the, mm -hmm. that's exactly uh -huh. the, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. so the exact point is that you get, so you know, this is. In all dimensions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's nice. So it's exactly what you said. Um, okay, so that says it's nice. Um, let me breeze through this so I can get to empirical data so people at least believe me that it does work in high dimensions. Um, there's a couple other concepts you can relate this to. If I were to put restrictions on the graphs, if I were to force the graph to be a union of complete graphs, one, then you get, you get the k-means objective function. If I were to restrict L to be a lower dimensional projection matrix, you get the SVD. SVDs I don't want to exactly get because I want to allow nonlinear data. For, for linear data, you can actually show something even stronger than this sort of vague projection matrix assertion because it will learn this lower dimensional linear structure. Um, but you know, the thing about SVD is that you really have to be careful with things like feature selection. It doesn't do well with point clouds, you know, clusters of point clouds that don't all live in linear subspaces. And this, we don't have that problem. Somehow it, it sort of hits both of these two things at once. Um, but we do get a similar number of degrees of freedom. So in terms of how much you have to fit, it's matching the SVD in terms of the number of free parameters. And you know, one of the nice things about the SVD is it's high dimensions without having exponentially growing numbers of parameters. Here, the number of degrees of freedom we get in a d-dimensional, locally d-dimensional thing is going to be uh, 2D. So it's actually pretty much the same number of degrees of freedom as an SVD without having to assume linearity. Um, the other nice thing to note is that somehow we don't have to guess the support. So I guess part of the interesting fact about this is that, you know, if I were to, the, you know, there, like sort of the way we're getting is huge, instead of getting this dense quadratic thing, we're getting this very low degree thing. What's nice is we don't have to guess the degree. So I guess um, a priori, we're getting something that's much lower dimensional than our space, but there's a discrete set of supports, and so they don't really count as degrees of freedom. So what we're actually getting in terms of real degrees of freedom is we only have the ones that come from the graph itself, and we get all the fitting properties of something like an SVD-ish. I mean, obviously, it doesn't work quite as well for planes. Uh, you know, for, but it's, you know, it has roughly the same number of degrees of freedom as an SVD, but it doesn't have to be told the support and or the adjacency or the subspace in advance. Or, and it also works when we don't have something linear. Uh, I say this is related but different to something called locally linear embeddings. There they actually choose the neighbors and they use asymmetric weights, and it's not the same thing. I more put this in for, in case someone said, isn't this machine, isn't this locally linear embeddings? No. Um, okay, so the basic point is there, you guess the support, and that loses a lot of the benefits of this. It has a very nice manifold learning nonlinear dimensionality reduction thing to it. I actually think a nice way of viewing this is, is learning the right regularization. So we'll see in a second, but one way of viewing what's going on here is that what we're really learning is a norm on the space of functions, and we're learning what it means for a function to be sort of locally well-behaved, because we're minimizing some energy. 
And here we're doing is we're actually saying if I give you a function on a bunch of points in space, there's a lot of ways to put a norm on it. And what a lot of the standard things would correspond to would be things like things that you get from gridding or something, um, or making a complete graph or taking neighbor. Like it's not obvious what the right norm on the space of functions on a graph is. And here we're learning the graph so that the norm given by the Laplacian, it, um, the, the, it gives us a very strong notion of what is a well-behaved function on our manifold. And it's one that corresponds to sort of nice, smooth, local linear structure, at least in the manifold motivation side of things. Um, but then all we're learning is this norm on the space of functions as opposed to learning this entire structure of a manifold. So we have many fewer degrees of freedom. We're really only learning, I claim all we really need for, the no for all the problems we're going to solve is this norm. So we're not going to learn anything other than it. Okay, so here's the application. Machine learning, the idea is we're going to find the graph and then use off-the-shelf graph algorithms for all of our problems. So for clustering, regression, and machine learning, we did regression already. You nail down the values on the points you know, you minimize the Laplacian. Um, for clustering, you cluster the graph. So you pick your favorite graph partitioning scheme. Um, I used a spectral one, so I used one sort of coming from Ingrid and Weiss, which says do something with the Laplacian, use the eigenvectors of the Laplacian, pick your favorite graph partitioning scheme and lift it. Um, and um, for classification, we use an algorithm that was a stand that's become a standard one in the machine learning literature. Basically what it says is how would you convert, if I gave you a graph Laplacian, how would you solve classification? So the idea is I'll give you a bunch of points labeled as being in different sets. And what you'll do is you'll just make vectors for indicator functions for the sets and you'll minimize Laplacian norms. So the idea is you'll take an indicator function yj for each class j. With two clusters, you'll use an indicator vector, vector for, say, one of them. In general, you should make k indicator vectors. You'll nail down their values according to what you know. So you know, you'll, if I gave you points that are labeled to be in a set or not, I nailed down those values. I then minimize subject to that, the z that minimizes the Laplacian's energy. And then that gives me, um, and then I'll just, for every point, I'll classify it according to whichever is the biggest. So, so um, if we just look at, sure. for example, how you did the clustering, it's a, sort of an intriguing thing. You're given a bunch of points, you're fitting a graph to it, you're taking the graph, you're embedding it in some space, right. and then that's giving you back a clustering of mm -hmm. the set of points that you started with. So, uh, and... You want, you're asking why is this not just... Yeah, why, I mean, why, why, why don't you go from the embedding of the points... Um, the there's one graph points. that will convince you. Um, do I have a whiteboard? Let me just say what it is. Draw two circles, um, concentric circles, with a lot of points on each. Uh, geometric clustering gets that wrong. So geometric clustering, like, cut it in half or something, whereas what, you re what this will do, the graph you'll get will be two cycles with very small weights between them, and the partition you'll get will actually be, this is sort of the canonical example see, uh, for things like that. The, uh, um, sort of, uh, the eigenvalue partition of this graph, right. you get the two circles. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this actually learns the local, it feels better with global structure like that. I mean, sometimes the point is partitioning doesn't only depend on closeness. It depends on you know, niceness of the. So it's, the point is it's learning the actual structure that the points sort of adhere to and then partitioning according to that. OK, so let me give some pictures of results. I'm going to have to do these quickly because I'm, I'm not sure what the end time is. I think it was somewhere between 5 and 5.30. I don't know what the right. Yeah. OK, so then I'll do this pretty quickly so I can get to the computation a little. But let me say that. Surprisingly, doing this with off-the-shelf graph things, it actually outperformed sort of hand-tuned problems. Like this I did for all, you know, it's a pretty wide range of problems, clustering, classification, regression. We basically used just what I said on the other slide without tuning, and it outperformed the best state-of-the-art tuned versions of these things in the literature. So what we did is we downloaded a bunch of, uh, of the stand, there's a repository of machine learning data sets that we just uh, downloaded all the ones that were roughly type checking. So asked one of these three questions, had data sets less than 10,000, because we didn't have, because, well, that was about what we could do, because we have to store a matrix, um, and just, and, and sort of picked them all. And it actually outperformed them on pretty much all of the standard data sets that we could find. Um, it didn't, on every data set, outperform every algorithm, but it outperformed every algorithm on an overwhelming majority of data sets. Um, and so, and, we, and I think that probably more can be done if we did this more intelligently with the graph problems themselves. So I'm going to draw the pictures. Um, I'll say there's, this is in my paper, so when I flash these up, don't think I'm hiding them. It's on my website. Yeah. Um, there's a paper called Fitting a Graph to Vector Data, um, ICML09, with these charts in them. But the basic point is uh, stuff in gray are things that we did at least as well as, and a lot of the graph is gray. Um, we never, even when we weren't out being, there's a couple things where we, when we lost, we only barely lost. And sometimes we won by a lot. So 
you know, this is the classification point. I guess, you know, if you look at it, the basic point is there's a lot of gray. We sort of compare favorably to all the different rows. Um, I'm going to, I'm sorry for doing this quickly because I'm running short on time. Um, I'm happy to go back to these during questions. Not feeding lib SVM, right? So we, uh, we about tie lib SVM on, um, okay. this is a truncation <laughs> of the graph. We, um, when we lose to lib SVM, we lose by a little. When we beat it, we beat it by a very large margin in a couple of them. I might have truncated that off of the, off of the picture, unfortunately. No. Um, the, uh, for vehicle data set, you lost, you lost a lot, right? Uh, for vehicle, this is the one that we did badly on compared to lib SVM. For another one, we beat it by a, so, you know, I mean, <laughs> the upshot is that we were comparable to lib SVM, highly tuned on the ones I've shown here, and on some of the others, we did much better, and I picked the wrong subset of my table. But, um, you know, so the longer slide that I wasn't rushing through said we strongly outperformed everything but lib SVM, and we sometimes, we were about 50-50 with lib SVM. Sometimes we won and sometimes we lost, but lib SVM is really good. Right. Right, so lib SVM, we, when we compared to lib SVM, we gave it every credit. This is the other thing is that we didn't have, one of the things that stinks about not having parameters is that when you make these charts, you can't tune them. And so for libSVM, we actually did is we tuned all the parameters to their optimal settings based on the data set so we wouldn't give it short shrift. Um, we compared it against ours with no tuning. So, I mean, okay, so the longer version of it was we were about 50-50 with highly tuned libSVM, um, depending on the data set. Um, and everything else was great. Um, you know, so this, that was the, you know, so I'm, again, I should say, I don't want to assert that we dominate all machine learning on everything. <laughs> I didn't mean to give that over strong assumption. We did well, and surprisingly well for a small amount of, of tuning. Um, yeah, so, and that's my more, you know, these are better written algorithms, um, <laughs> was the other, you know, so the fact that this means at least we have something reasonable here, and that without tuning, we did very well. Did you um, we didn't. We alpha was 0.1 for all pictures. I mean, if you tune um, it, 0.1 was a good idea. Um, we didn't tune it. We didn't want to. We thought tuning was cheating, so we wanted to at least we wanted to at least be as honest as possible. So we tuned everybody else and kept ours with 0.1, just because we didn't want to overstate. Um, so. Generally, it seems that the, the soft does better than the hard. Um, I think it was marginally better, but not always better. You know, sometimes one, sometimes the other. Soft was was vastly faster. Mm -hmm for yes. something I'm, I'll get to in a second, but the reason is that the soft is, the reason, the real reason for soft is it's a little bit, it's never much worse as far as I can remember than the hard one, but it's a lot faster to compute because it's got nicer structure. But is it sometimes much better or it's already? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, these two were usually pretty close. Um, soft so, so was tended to be better. So that's some justification why the alpha really doesn't matter because yeah. the, it's, all, anyway, will always be approximately the hard okay. one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would think the right thing to do probably is to prune outliers first, <laughs> and then maybe these, like, you know, these things are really, the time where they're going to differ a lot is when you have vertices that really are, out, it, it is outlier type things. I think if we did this more carefully, we should have pruned outliers, and then the differences would even have gotten smaller. Um, so I think soft with outliers pruned out a bit was probably the thing that, not of the ones that I have the best answer. I think that there's, I don't know, I'm not sold on our constraints being right. So when you compare to... BP is assumed, assumed leaf propagation. Yes, I believe so. So for that, you need to under, assume there's some underlying graphical model, and there's so many choices in that. So, um, what so I believe mean? BP was um, a explicitly, so in the actual paper, this is why I thought I was doing this quickly. In the actual paper, BP was explicitly specified other person's code. That highly, you know, it was, it was a, it was a, one of the papers that's standardly used to represent that class of algorithms, and it was we ran the the one that was the most recently. So these are not meant to be readable. The BP was a belief propagation based technique that I don't want to. The paper this wasn't the section I did the simulations for, and it was two years ago. So I don't want to try to bluff that I remember what it was. But it was a it was the these were the ones we all the algorithms we could dig up, and this was the one that from that class people wrote positive things about. Um, you know, like it was, again, I'm doing amateur machine learning and, um, and uh, we wanted to, we, we did this by just looking through the literature for what people thought was a good idea. So it comes with that caveat. Um, but, yeah? So, so you, you, you ran some classification algorithm on the graphs that you got from your reconstruction? I ran some, some classification right, algorithm on, on the, the classification. Graphs. Right, so we did the, re we took just the point set without the classification data. 
learned the graph, and then we did that indicator function thing that I said in the last slide. So, I mean, so I'm wondering if, if, if you can say that, uh, let's say, if you compare to SEM, if, if the problem was with the graphs or with the classification algorithm that was... Um, I think the problem was that we just didn't tune it. I mean, I, but it's not really a problem also. Like, you know, SVM is a good idea. Could you have done better right. with a better classification even on Linux? Um, I would think that if we really tuned it, we could have done better than we did. Um, I don't want to, you know, I think that... I mean, the real point is that S, you know, support vector machines are an optimal answer to something, um, right? Like they are actually answering a specific question with provable optimality. Um, I suppose there should be data sets that they therefore perform better than a non-optimal algorithm. You know, so like I don't want to say that this should always work. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think, the question I think is that like, did you lose um, the information in constructing the graph, or is it, uh, are you um, just I think that processing was, the graph weekly? I think that one thing is we might have we could have done a little better probably if we incorporated the known classification data somewhere else. I think if we, I think we should have done data cleaning of various kinds, you know, that we weren't able to do by the sort of blind version of it. Like we should have, we should have nicened up our data a little. These are small, these are sometimes very noisy data sets and we didn't do anything like pruning out outliers or smoothing it or whatever. You know, so, okay. So let me just quickly flash through to the part I wanted to get to before I'll, I'll answer these questions. Let me come back to them just so I can kind of get a little bit farther. For regression, we actually did better. Um, you know, comparably even better than this. Um, the gaps in the table are because they, the algorithms uh, didn't terminate or crash and, you know, there were large instances. So again, um, my basic point is not entirely gray, but some gray and a fair amount of gray here. Here, I, my actual assertion of um, never much worse and often better was, is actually, I think, a legitimate one. Um, clustering, clustering, there's a technicality I want to go into. We compared it to k-means and Jordan Weiss. Here I had actually, um, and here there were two instances of the algorithm. I don't want to get into what they were. I think that if you view this as a reg, there's a whole separate question of how you cluster a graph using eigenvectors. And as a separate comment that I don't, didn't discuss in this paper, I think that right now there's a, mis there's a wrong, there's a problem with the way they're doing it, which is that the number of eigenvectors you use and the number of clusters have no reason to be the same thing. So in this paper we implemented two things. We implemented the one that the t equals k, just to be fair in our comparison, and the one that I thought t should be chosen according to a rule that I wrote in the paper. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure which one you think is the fair one, um, but they tended to be a little different and not always drastically different. And here we did never, we sometimes slightly were outperformed by Jordan Weiss, but only by very small quantities, um, if at all. I think there was at least one where they were. Um, okay, at least I can't find one where we, I thought, Okay, maybe we always outperformed it. Um, I thought we had a couple where we didn't, but anyway, the point was that sometimes we won by like multiples of I 10. Missed, uh, I, did I miss, I, there should be at least one. No, oh, this is k-means, this is hard, oh, I see. K-mean, I don't know. There was one data set, Iris, where here, so the one that, I, the one where the 0 0.1 soft with t chosen um, was the one that I think is my actual proposed algorithm. That one never lost by anything substantial, and here you'll notice a factor of 10 against some of the others, like an error. Um, so I don't want to overclaim on this. My basic point is it did it surprisingly well. I think on this one, we, it actually, on two of the three of them, the one it, I can say conclusively, we never found something where it was much worse, and we found many where it was substantially better. On the first one, sometimes SVM won, sometimes we did, but at least didn't perform, you know, this was a very unoptimized construction and didn't perform terribly is more the point I want to convey. Um, and that I think if one did better actual machine learning with the graphs, then I think it would, I could strengthen the claim. Um, okay, so those are my clustering results. Um, and I think I'm running a bit short on time, so I just want to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw the rough picture of the efficiently computing thing, just because I've, I've been alluding forward to it a couple times, but I'm not going to really do it. So this is going to come at lightning pace. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, roughly the point is you do some algebra, and you can show that this is a convex quadratic that you're minimizing subject to linear constraints, so it's polytime. Polytime is a, tr it shows polynomial time, but it's a bad polynomial. We can do better. Um, the better is that if you actually play with the algebra a bit, you can turn it into a specific convex program that happens to be one that empirically is very good, which is a non-negatively squares problem. So in general, the codes for non-negatively squares are orders of magnitude faster than arbitrary convex programming. And so this is one of the reasons why soft was much faster. Um, the more interesting point was that actually much faster than either of these, there's kind of a nice algorithmic question, which is that we, it's a, I think a, a question that's coming up even in the interim between when we wrote this and now, a lot with the compressed sensing world, which is that 
we know we, we have this matrix, and we know that it tends to be sparse in the answer. Like we know that we should get you know, a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix with degree, average degree 10, say. Um, therefore, the question is, should we, we somehow really only want to find um, 10 times 10,000 as opposed to 10,000 squared. And all of the off-the-shelf anything that does you know, general non-negatively squares or whatever is going to have to do, it's going to have to work with dense matrices. So somehow you, st you want a sparse solution, but you don't know the support of sparsity, so you end up having to pass through dense matrices for most of the work. So it turns out there's a reasonable thing to do here, which is it's kind of a mix between an interior point and a simplex method. And so what you do is you guess a support, you solve your problem subject to the support constraint, you then use local operations, you then find by a Lagrangian term, you find out what the best new, new you sort of swap in some new constraints, you grow from D, you know, D size support to 2D support, you minimize over that, and then a bunch of your things drop out, and then you kind of walk around the, around the possibilities. This means you only work with sparse things. Um, and it gained us a couple orders of magnitude on running time, which is why we were able to do things of size, say, 10,000. Because, you know, in general, any linear algebra with that on at least my computer is pretty slow. So, you know, 10,000, I guess we could have done. 100,000, we couldn't have done. You know, this, is, this made a huge difference because you only worked with... So, so this is a heuristic? It's not something... So it's provably going to give the... It will probably terminate with the right answer. The running time um, is... I mean, it, it's sort of... Is, it's simplex method like. So at least nominally, you know, you're, you're changing supports and you're trying to see how many iterations it takes. The answer was less than 20. Um, you know, it's the answer for a lot of these. Provably, I think I can maybe give you a polynomial bound. I'm not sure. I probably could because I think that, I think I can give you a polynomial bound if I wanted to. Not a good one. I maybe can't even give you a polynomial bound. Yeah, so generally, I don't know, 20 is the answer in real life. And so it meant to be, that was why this is not the one where I have a, an out, so I can say polynomial time and efficient, but not with the same algorithm. Um, okay, so it would be nice to have a good analysis. I think it exists. Um, yeah. I think, I think in general, understanding this for optimization is a good idea. Like I think in general, this is an increasingly important question, which is that we have a lot of these a lot of questions that are coming up where we have a known sparsity of a solution in a dense space and we don't know the support. In the compressed sensing literature, they've actually started, they've got algorithms that have the same feel, um, things like basis pursuit. So, okay. Uh, computation time, I'm gonna skip. It was, we can do things say 10,000 or less, I guess is the right, an um, is the right answer. Um, and now I'm just gonna conclude by giving you some quick open questions. So one is just, I don't think we nailed the graph, right? Like there's two of them, so it really, the fact that I gave you two answers means I probably don't fully get the right one. I have some general thoughts on, I think the right one probably is more linear algebraic than vertex by vertex. I'm happy to talk about it offline, but there's at least what the constraints are. It's not completely clear. There are some properties we know they have to have, but it's not obvious what the right one is, and maybe there are other more natural graphs. Um, it would be nice to have parameters if for no other reason. It would be nice when we have those pictures against the SVM when they optimize a billion parameters and we don't. It would be nice to be able to at least do that. Um, it's not obvious how you would parameterize such a construction. I guess there are some possibilities, but it's really not clear to me how you would or whether you'd want to. In most cases, it's a good thing to not have parameters, but it would be nice if there was a reasonable, if there was a reason why we were assuming a parameter equaled one, it would be nice to know that. Um, are the graphs unique after perturbation? I think yes, but I have no proof. Um, Boundaries are weird, which is what was, I was getting, uh, some of the things I was talking, I was being asked about a bit. I think that we might want to, I think there might be something you can do better about how to interpolate off the ground, off the boundary, off the sort of way away from where your point set is or off the graph itself. So when I add a new point, right now we recompute a graph. It would be nice to have something more incremental. Getting that right would be good. Um, computing them much faster, we're, there's no obvious reason why we couldn't, um, gain a couple orders of magnitude in running time. That would, right now we sort of work for, I guess the set of data sets I'd consider are not images. Um, more or less, you know, things with 10,000, not a million. It would be nice, you know, this actually has a... Of points. So the, this is the number of points because it's the... In how many dimensions? Whatever really, I mean those are, you're really just computing. All that really matters is the inner products. Um, like, you know, the, uh, the algorithm itself, if you look at the optimization, only depends on the pairwise inner products of the, of the coordinate points. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, the, de the dependence on the dimension of the points is pretty mild. But the, and the really thing that kills you is that you're looking at a Laplacian that's n by n, where n is the number of points. And so 
a certain point, just writing it down gets big. And if you try to find its eigenvalues, you run into trouble. I mean, like, you know, that's really, if you ever work with anything dense or you don't do something really well, you know, it's really on the size of the points that your issues come. You could actually do this just with a kernel. So um, it would be nice to do this with images, for example, because images, I think, ideologically are well suited to some of this. <coughs> so it would be nice to get a couple orders of magnitude. I think a few more orders of magnitude would go a long way. Um, it would be nice to understand the iterative algorithm. I guess those are my other questions. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? We still ask some questions. In yeah. fact, I'd like to know. I'm actually, let me give people a chance to leave without feeling bad about it before I answer questions. I'm happy to stick around for questions, but I don't want to hold people hostage with questions. So. Um. Yeah, so I wanted to ask whether, are you arguing that you know, Guinness-specific embeddings of graphs are not really relevant to the kind of tests people are interested in machine learning. One more time. That Guinness-specific. Guinness-specific embeddings of graphs on Manifold are not relevant to tasks that machine learning people are interested in. So right now we look at planar embeddings. And right. I could argue that you know I want to find an embedding for, for a graph, but I can specify also as an input uh, the Guinness of the graph. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of distinction, do you expect this to be of relevance to the kind of tasks at hand? Well, I mean, in some sense, this is aiming for low genus. If you had some really good reason that you're, you know, like whenever you have like known structure, I guess there's a reason to incorporate it. If I told you my graph is genus 7 because it comes from the following seven-hold torus, I, you know, I guess that's probably good to use. In some sense, the points may be stronger than not knowing the genus. It's that you don't really want to learn the manifold itself. We happen to get a graph that respects sort of planarity or low genus structure. But I think the major win from, well, the major, re major reason this tends to do well is that you're really cutting down the number of parameters by not trying to learn all, the whole graph, the whole manifold, rather. You're not trying to learn, you're first of all only learning something conform, you know, learning a conformal structure. You're not learning a full metric. You're only learning a, nor you know, a conformal norm in the face of functions. So you're learning a much smaller quantity. It will tend to respect, like if I gave you a low genus a low, remember, you're not given a graph. You're starting, if I tell you that I have something I expect to be low genus for some good reason, I guess it's quite likely if you have a, you know, if you have a reasonable enough number of samples that this, if it lives in a low dimensional space or lives roughly near an embedding of a manifold with enough information, you'll tend to respect the low genus structure. I mean, this tends to want to, you know, want to be, meet some of these simplicity, you know, simpler constraints. The, if, my, my basic point is that for these problem, types of problems we're trying to solve, knowing the whole manifold structure is usually overkill. And because when you try to, if you try to learn the manifold first and then ask a question about it, what you're doing is you're giving yourself a lot of degrees of freedom that don't affect your answer and you become prone to overfitting. So here, what this is doing is it's getting you around that, at least in one way. If you have specific reasons to know, like either if A, you actually care about your manifold for some reason, not because you want to classify, regress, or cluster, but because someone asks you what your manifold is. Like there's certainly instances where knowing the manifold has value. Then clearly not learning the manifold is a bad thing. Um, my assertion was that for these problems, they only depend on one thing. They depend on the being able to measure the norm of the basic functions and measure sort of how linear they are, um, has you know, harmonic energy on them. And so for that reason, um, you, that's all you should try to learn. Um, if you have topological knowledge or topological goals, then it would be a different, a different setting. Did that answer your question? Did I answer the right question? So I, I want to have a follow-up question on that. I was wondering whether you've um, looked into hypergraph embeddings. Into solving this for hyper, into learning a hypergraph. The yes. answer is no, we have not. Um, we haven't. Um, I can't, con I, mean, no I don't. For is it I mean, I guess there might be. Um, I, it's at least not, it's, the answer is I haven't thought about it. It's not completely obvious. I'm happy offline to try to think about it, um, but I haven't yet. Um, yeah. So, so, so to some extent, what, uh, what you want is some kind of graph with stop eigenvectors are similar to the points that you that you that you, that you're given? So, um, I mean, it's not. At, so at, at, a, at a rough SPD. level, I mean, at a rough level, the yes. point is that if you try, we're learning a matrix. The mat what matters about the matrix is x transpose L x. If the matrix, you know, so if you have reason that your eigenvalues, you know, your spectrum has 
is dominated. It depends on, on, depends on what the spectrum is, of course. But like, if you expect that your matrix is near enough to low rank that it's dominated by its high eigenvalues, and this will be exactly the case. It's so if, if like the, uh, the optimality conditions of, of, the, of the optimization problem that you're solving somehow imply that you know that the I mean characterize the points in, in terms of the graph. Yeah. I mean you're really using the whole spectrum, but you're using the top ones more, right? Well, like, like if, if I if um, I if I get, suppose you start with the graph, and what are the what what would be the points so that I would get back the graph? If I start with a graph and then get back the graph. I mean no yes what what would points be that would give me exactly that graph? Like, I mean, as a function of, as a simple function of the graph. Um, let me not try or, to nail that here. Um, or, I mean, roughly what you'd want to do is you'd want to lay it out in space so that point, you know, I think you'd probably get it back. I won't, the only thing I won't swear to, there might be a boundary condition. If you're letting me punt on boundary conditions, or, you know, let me impose boundary conditions, because I don't really want to try off the top of my head to get that right. Other than the boundary conditions, lay your graph out in space by, nailing down your boundary according to these magical boundary conditions that I don't really have, and then minimize the energy, the spring energy. So let it kind of mini you know, minimize the harmonic energy, and that's, that's, that will roughly give you back, other, other than the boundary conditions. If you oppose those, that will work. There is a setting of the boundary conditions that will make, make me not have to say this, that sentence of let me give you magical non-existent boundary conditions, but I can't do it online. Um, Okay, so let's thank Great. John. Thanks.